Welcome to q and I'm your host, Mike, and this is our first program. Basically, what happens here is we take questions from the community, research them so you don't have to, and try and come up with the best answer we can give. Where I am not an expert in any of these fields, but I know how to get answers. And you submit your questions via Google+. Plus. You can submit your questions via Twitter, or you can go to Gamers Bay, the Gamers Bay community in Google+, and submit your questions there in the official Q&A with Mike thread that will be posted in each, um, each month. And with me is my co-host from my old show that I used to do on this channel called Geektastic Weekly. And introduce yourself. Hello, I'm uh, Willie Kirkpatrick. How you doing? And we've been friends for a long time. We're roommates, and uh, he's agreed to come on the show with me to uh, help out with these questions. Yep. Okay, let's move on to question number one. Question number one comes from Gamers Bay member Origami Ray, and Origami is asking basically how many, um, how many more. Um, does the PS4 sell than the Xbox One? How much more does the PS4 sell than the Xbox One? And this has been a hard one to answer because... For one thing, Microsoft does not publish sales figures for the Xbox One. And so you have to make guesstimates based on this. Luckily, NPD, which tracks retail sales... <coughs> takes a look at revenue made on particular items and they can do a guesstimate based on that but they're several months behind because April 12th they just got the figures for March as of this month April 12th they just got the figures for March and the PlayStation 4 was ahead of the Xbox one in March and as of January uh, we have some numbers for January. The Xbox One sold 53 million units in January. Whereas, sorry, the, the PlayStation 4 sold 53 million units in January, whereas the Xbox One only sold 15 million. Uh, so how? So wait, what was the difference again? That was how much difference? Uh, wow, that's a big difference. But. At the same yeah. time, there was at the same time there was a dip in sales in game consoles. Now, from what I understand, there has been a ninety percent increase in game console sales since then. And right now, so Microsoft's numbers could currently be higher then. Microsoft's numbers could be higher, but as of March, the PlayStation Four is still outselling them. Uh, we don't have any actual numbers yet. NPD has made an announcement that it is higher. But as for actual published numbers, we don't have anything yet. Probably by the end of the month, we'll have something that has mm -hmm. actual published numbers. As I said, they have to, they make guesstimates for Microsoft because they don't release any sales figures for the, uh, they don't release how many I mean, they it, actually it, sell. One, one would, one would, would think that if they had better sales numbers, they might be more apt to tout them. You would think. Yeah. But I mean, that's kind of what—that's kind of what crosses my mind. You, I see that gap. Just, just in an outside observer, I see that gap, and then I hear they're not putting their numbers out. I'm like, well, are they really doing as good as they say? And it's in their interest if they're not really making that good of sales. It's not to say the product's bad, but if they just don't have the numbers, it's kind of hard to tout such low numbers if that's what's going on. I know, and you know. They both came out around relatively around the same time, the two consoles did. They're very, they came out very close to one another. I think of, there's only like maybe a uh, one or two month difference in them. Mm -hmm. So it's not like the PlayStation 4 had yeah. a head start on them. Now, just as a thought, are these global numbers or are they just U.S. numbers? 
Uh, NP. Because I wonder if Microsoft's having penetration problems in foreign countries. They're definitely having trouble in Japan. I can tell you that. Um, they. Can't... I wonder. I wonder if this is affecting their sales numbers. X the X look. the Xbox 360 did better in Europe than it did in did in Asia. Okay. They did much better in Europe. Uh, it is this these figures I think are for the U.S. As for worldwide, I am not so. Okay. I have not been able to find any figures. It's, on it's that. an amazing difference then if these are. It's an amazing difference if these are U.S. numbers then. Yeah. That 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 they're being outsold nearly what was that what was that, almost three to one nearly. Mm -hmm. Well, the Xbox so. the Xbox One has had they had image issues from the get go. Because well, they hurt themselves when they did that. That I remember hearing about that one point where they were like they were going to lock the system down in this really weird way where you couldn't even if it was a disc based game you couldn't take it from one console to another or something. Mm -hmm. Or it was something like that. That you couldn't resell the game. Like, you get it from a store, and then some, you know, you have these little game shop stores, or not GameStop, GameStop, but these little localized stores that would buy back games or whatever. You can trade them in, trade games and stuff. Well, remember when the, uh, when the PS4, or when the PS, uh, went, sorry, the Xbox One launched, there was that whole debacle about the DRM. And then for the longest right. time... For the longest time, Microsoft stuck by the Kinect. They absolutely would not budge on the Kinect. They were trying to shove it down everyone's throat, and nobody wanted it. It came to the point to where they don't even sell the Kinect with the console anymore. I mean, we have an Xbox One, and we don't have a Kinect. It didn't come with one. And... Yeah. You now... They don't even require the um, connect features anymore. They've even gone so far as to um, make the um, system resources that are locked for the connect I th available I, I do to game think developers. It has been, yeah, I do think it has been this impression of Microsoft being a little heavy-handed on a lot of things, and they're they're kind of the way they kind of do things in general, I think has hurt their numbers somewhat. And that may be some of the, the, the shift that has gone with the DRM, the Connect, and things like that. That gamers feel pushed around and they don't necessarily like that being pushed around. So I think I think Microsoft's been changing some of their aspects and policies and things, but at the same time they've had an image problem they're trying to overcome. They, they've had a very serious image problem because what a lot of gamers out there don't know is that Microsoft has had a bad reputation for a long time. Now, they've recently, um, since last year, had a CEO change. Steve Ballmer, who mm -hmm. has been there since almost the beginning with Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. is no longer the head of the company. <laughs> you, you mean Bill Gates? Well, Bill Gates, Bill Gates, sorry, yep, sorry. <sighs> <laughs> Steve Jobs, the head of Microsoft. What's the difference? Said, they we'll both send, have we'll, massive we'll send, egos. We'll send, it, uh, we'll send Gates over to, uh, over to Apple and see how well they all work out. What's It'll the difference? The they reverse. both have massive egos, but um, yeah, but ever since uh, Bill Gates, ever since the Bill Gates era, and he's yeah. out. Yeah. And Satya Nadella is um, I hope I got his name right, is now the head of the company. And ever since he signed on, a lot of things have been happening. There have been some criticisms because of the layoffs, <sighs> the massive layoffs. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Jerry Barnacles, he was a member of, uh, he was a programmer for Microsoft, and he was laid off. Now he does YouTube full time, and um, and it's, they've done stuff like they've released a lot of Microsoft components, open source like .NET. And I think it was things. a survival thing for Microsoft. There, there comes a point in any evolution of anything, any any creature, including a company, that they either evolve or they die. Yeah. And I think Microsoft's had to evolve to the modern era, or it was in danger of going extinct. And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of where they were, and that's kind of how that kind of played out. Yeah. But I think it's hurt the Xbox One sales to some degree in the process of that shoveling and shuffling yeah. around that they've not been able to stay as focused as strongly as they would probably have liked to.
Yeah, and, and now they um, again you know, market penetration and stuff like that. Yeah, and now they've got this thing with the um, Universal Windows app, pro- their Universal Window app, Windows apps, where a developer that creates a game for Windows 10 on the Xbox One, that game will also run on Windows 10 or any Windows 10 device. Mm-hmm. I mean, they have um, Rise of the Tomb Raider. They have a collection of the uh, first three Gears of War games. Quantum uh, Quantum Break recently released what uses that. There have been some issues. There's been some criticisms. Some have uh, mm-hmm, accused mm-hmm. Microsoft of of trying to um, take over PC gaming, using it because there are certain limitations as to um, universal it's a closed platform. That's it's a the closed thing. platform. It's sort of a it's a closed platform. Yeah. So because Fraps can't record gameplay from these apps, um, you can't use applications that that uh, have overlays, so you can't launch them with Steam, uh, and you can it, only it, use a, 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 a Xbox One or Xbox 360 controller with them. You can use keyboard and mouse. It's a but, closed yeah. platform, but like any modern closed platform, it's going to have issues. Yeah. Um, it's going to have its followings because of the games people like, etc. But in the end, they're going to have they're going to learn kind of the hard way that the more closed your platform is. In you know, kind of the way things are changing, the harder it's going to be to really get people interested, and that lack of interest because of the closed platform can contribute to these low numbers. Yeah, and until recently, it it couldn't even support SLI, and and that's been changing. And you know, the heads of Microsoft and the heads of the Xbox division um, have come out and said they are currently working on those problems, and so they do have to address yeah. them. Or else, yeah, Steam and other competitors will basically trounce them. Yeah, essentially. And 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 it reflects in the numbers they currently have, being and, almost three to one. So. And that's likely why you're seeing, um, you're seeing um, the Xbox One not doing so well. Not as many exclusives right. as the PS4. Also, the fact that um, Call of Duty has gone over to the PS4. There's a big shift right there. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ray, I hope this answers your question. Let's move on. Okay, another Gamers Bay member. Funk, um, Funkanik Challenger, hope I'm saying your name right. Uh, asks if I uh, think there is a uh, golden age of gaming, or was there ever a golden age of gaming? If, if so, why? If not, why? I think there was. I think there were. I think there were two periods in gaming history that were a golden age. It was not the 2600 era. Uh, that was the very beginning. No one really understood what made a good game. And during the 2600 era, most games were just basically arcade titles. Not not arcade titles from the arcade, but they were arcadey sort of games. They were very simple, very basic. We didn't start seeing more <clears throat> complex games, the kind of genres that we see today, until after the crash. That was when a lot of companies that were making games on consoles moved over to computers. They moved over to the IBM PC, which was growing in popularity. Moved over to like the Commodore 64, Apple computers, and there were a ton of different competing formats. You know, there were of different computer systems, most of which don't exist today anymore. But you could, back in that era, you could buy magazines that had pages of code. And these were games that you type in yourself, and you can store them on disc or cassette, whichever type of storage your computer used back then and use it and run it anytime you want. These were full games and sometimes full applications. That was the era that um, that this came from. There were even choose your own adventure books where you actually typed out code on you know on either uh, Tandy system, Tandy color computer systems 
or Apple computer systems. There were some for the Commodore. And it was an era where a lot of companies were trying a lot of really interesting new stuff. And there were some amazing games, some stuff that you really don't, some experimentation of things that you really don't see right now. But you're starting to see a little more because of indie studios. With uh, games like No Man's Sky, which are probably one of the most ambitious game projects I've ever seen. But so would... one could say that what you're saying as a golden era would be like the, the biggest era of, say, innovation. When biggest things were era being of the most innovative. Yeah. yeah. Where you see the most unique types of things. Yeah, that period between 1993 and I would say 1990, 1998 was one of those golden eras. Another golden era was in the 90s. I would say around 95, 96 up to 2000. That was when gaming moved out of the uh, 2D era, moved into 3D. That's when we got the PlayStation. That's when we got the um, the and Nintendo 64. That's when we got the first true 3D accelerated graphics cards for PC. The 3D FX Interactive Voodoo, Voodoo 2, Voodoo 3, and the first NVIDIA graphics oh, cards. I remember first, the days. First true graphics cards. You know, Doom wasn't the first first-person shooter, but it made, it brought first-person shooters into the mainstream. And then Quake changed everything with, um, with 3D graphics, 3D polygon graphics. And Quake 2 just pushed that forward. Then Unreal came along, and Unreal just... Unreal changed everything. It changed everything. That was the literally. true birth of the modern first-person shooter era. Yes. That's pretty much the birth, the true birth of it. I mean, uh, Doom was sort of the, you know, the the beginning seeds of it. But I think mm -hmm. it didn't come to real fruition until then, and that's yeah. when it really became. This is how it should be. Yeah. And now we are on the cusp of another golden era, golden age, because we're starting to see projects by indie studios. They've gotten, they've gotten big enough, they've got the talent now, they've got the ability to do experimental stuff that the big AAA studios just can't do, can't afford to do anymore. And we're starting to see a lot of really innovative, innovative. things coming out of them. And we're only going to some see more. Some will work, some won't, but it's really neat stuff coming. Oh, I mean... Look at look at um, Hello Games and No Man's Sky. You got a team that's like twelve people working on a game that, from what we've seen, has AAA quality visuals it, and sound. In a, in a way, in a way, the garage type innovation that used to predominate those early eras, the mm -hmm. things where you'd see somebody making something in their garage is kind of back because technology has reached a stage where somebody can be making something doesn't need a large group of people you know 10 15 people at you know mm -hmm. best each bring in their own talents can make something and the internet as a distribution platform can get it out there now in ways that were um, impossible back then where you'd have to be a publisher or something it the, 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 it's wide open it's a wide open field for a lot of stuff the internet has changed a lot of that and also yeah. The fact that a lot of the tools that are... The, that, tools. the tools. The tools are a biggie. Most of the tools are free now. Uh, mm -hmm. I understand... And the machines that they have are powerful enough to do those things now. I understand Unity is no longer a pay product. I'd have to look into that one. Yeah. And... But even still, the, the most amazing thing to me is the fact that larger companies like that who have some of these engines like Epic are putting their technology out there to get people started and you can you have the rights to use it you know technologies for mm -hmm. the you know deployment of a game that was unavailable at one point so um, no man opened the doors big time yeah no man's sky i don't think that's an unreal engine 4 game i think that's a custom engine it would likely to, have to would, be 
Yeah, it would probably be based because of the way that game is constructed. But I mean, even if even if it's not that, I mean, it still those technologies are available if you want to use them. Yeah. And the the cost of doing it, the the barrier of cost of entry is no longer what it once was. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, you really need the talent. The talent is what is, is most in demand. You like to have the skills and stuff. Yeah, and you're getting more people because what you're starting to see now. Around this period, you're getting people who grew up with. There were there are people. We we when we grew up, we were the idea of something like the internet was just sci sci-fi to us, and then it finally came. But there are people mm -hmm. now that are going to college now who grew up after the birth of the internet. Well, the, not the birth, but after the internet became available to everyone they've never known a time without the internet and they've yeah, been exposed that's this to a lot generation. of information yeah you're starting to kids see running those. around with tablets oh yeah yeah and you're starting to see them get out there they're going to they're going to college uh they've never known a time without game consoles and gaming pcs and they are getting into the business a lot of them are very talented. A lot of them have a lot of amazing ideas. And now they live in an era where you've got an incredible idea. You've got friends who also have, friends from college who also have their own skills and abilities in this field. You can get together, get a group of people together, Go to Kickstarter, get funding, and boom, you've got a company. Mm -hmm. And you're making a game. You know, and you sell it, and you make a few hundred thousand dollars, and then you make another game, and you start making a name for yourself, and then, then suddenly you're being featured on IGN and mm -hmm. a bunch of other internet, uh, <laughs> internet news outlets, and you're in the next big big uh, game developer and that's what this particular era is is allowing to happen is... yeah like earlier i was perusing steam and i stopped to look at a game because i saw paradox paradox was it paradox interactive just to see what the game was because they had made another game that i was a big fan of hmm. what i stopped and took a look because i wanted to see what it was they had to offer what was that? It other was sort game? of like a civilization, um, Stellar, Stellar or something. I forget the Stellar. exact name of it. Stellar, I think. And it was basically kind of a look like a civilization game, a space era civilization game. But I stopped to take a look because I saw a developer that I recognized, and it was one of these you know, again small startup companies that have been able to do a little more now because they were successful by revitalizing a franchise mm -hmm. that one of the AAA companies tossed to the side. Mm. Now, what was the other games that you liked from them? Um, well, that was the one that I was taking a look at just to see, but the one that I'm referring to is uh, City Skylines. Ah, because they were the they ones, were the ones that did that. Them and Colossal Order, right. Them and Colossal Order worked together to create City Skylines. I'm not sure the exact organization, there, but I know that Parala uh, Paradox Interactive was part of that. But I'd stopped to look at this other game because I'd recognized the game from this little, you know, the name of this little company that... Otherwise, I wouldn't have heard of, but they had a small company. I think they had like 12 employees when they put that game together, um, City Skylines, and had revitalized you know, that whole city-building genre where you know, the large AAA company had let it go to rot. Yeah, it's basically about the same number of people that uh, Hello Games has and a mm -hmm. lot of other indie studios. I, uh, some... It's pretty amazing what they're able to do these days. Some games have been made by just one person. I mean, I believe mm -hmm. Cave and they Story be big was done by one person. Cave Story was a was a big mm -hmm. breakout hit that got indies on the uh, indie studios on the map. Super Meat Boy mm -hmm. was another one that was made by just a small, a very small group. I think it was even a single individual that developed that game. So, Funkanek Challenger. I hope that answers your particular question. We may have uh, gone a little more, but... <laughs> <laughs> I 
That's what we do on this show. We, 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 get, we get off on a tangent. We go off in the left field. and I don't know. Then we go quantum. <laughs> okay. Over on Gamers Bay. Again, Old School Video Game Vault asks, and this one's a big one, asks why so many companies are skipping out on E3 this year. Uh, basically, ah. Wargaming... Disney, EA, Activision, they will not have a booth. They will... Now, EA will have a keynote. EA, EA and Activision will have keynotes, but they won't have a booth. They won't have a presence there. Their games may uh, be featured in other booths, um, Sony's booth specifically, but um, they will not have one. And I, I think... I think it comes down to money. I think yeah. it's just not worth the cost of doing it. That's what it's, I it's was going to say. It, yeah. You know, it's expensive to attend these shows. I mean, the um, Entertainment Software Association rents the venue. This is in Las Vegas, by the way. And they rent the venue, and then... So you know it's expensive. Yeah, it's expensive. And then they lease out uh, spots in on the show floor to all these companies that attend and of course you know the the big studios get the pick of the best spots first but mm -hmm. that's not that's not the uh, end of it then there is the fact that these companies they can't afford to keep staff members on hand that do nothing but set up um, booths for shows they hire contractors. There's construction. There's electrical work. There is networking. And then they have to bring in uh, people f for, to staff. staff. They bring in some other people and they bring in outsiders to staff it. They have booth babes that they hire. And some of them, the, the big ones, they bring in security people. For their booths, so it can cost upwards for a big company like Electronic Arts. It can cost upwards to a million, and sometimes they'll even have entertainment in their booths. They'll have like a mm -hmm. live, live show going on with a band or something like that. They've had that once before. Yeah. And, and what are they really getting for all this money that they're spending? Yeah, you know, that's and the thing. E3 is. A trade show that's closed to the public and E3 started in 1995 and the internet was around then but you didn't have um, what you have today you didn't have IGN you didn't have machinima you didn't have all these um, online gaming news sites back then yeah half, yeah, half your announcements you're making at these uh, at these big trade shows have already kind of, if not leaked, have been announced already on the on the internet. People are like, yeah. we don't need to go because we already know all I mean, this stuff. We're we sitting here bored because we're like, we get all this. Yeah, we didn't have yeah. um, we didn't have YouTube and Twitch. You had to get all your stuff through magazines, and so this this show made sense then to have to have it then. And there are so many other. Um, there are so many other shows that happen throughout the year. You have several in Europe, um, one in, one really big one in Germany, and then there is the then there's the Penny Arcade Expo PAX, which takes place twice a year in different places, and those are yeah. open to the public. I, I think those shows, those fan shows, where the the public's invited and the really you know, the people who are really into it can come and you know hobnob with their mm -hmm. with their favorite developers and their favorite companies and I, th I think those would be the things that will survive i think e3 is a closed thing it's probably not really going to survive in the long term i'm not saying it'll disappear but it's going to have to morph maybe go open or something because that way you know people can i think like any kind of thing where the gamers can come in and enjoy sharing time with the developers on just Enjoying the products and enjoying, you know, the 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 stuff that they really you know are into, you know, mm -hmm. the, the the product, the games, the IPs and stuff, and really having fun with that. I think that's where it's really going to morph to. Yes, because those are what's yes. successful. 
there's already been some talk of making E3 open to the public recently. I would be. I think it would. If if anything, that would revitalize it. Yeah. Letting be, people come in and hobnob with their favorite companies. Because the. You know, basically the companies are paying this massive amount of money, and it's mm -hmm. only for video game industry insiders, and yeah. no one in what's the public. What's the point of that? In. Yeah, what's the what's the point of that? They're not reaching the people that they're there to reach, which is the public. Get on there, find the YouTubers. Public. You know, they should be reaching out to YouTubers and Twitchers mm -hmm. and all those folks, and that get them in there, and you know, even still have it open. That give them kind of first dibs at getting a shot at seeing all the latest and greatest, and being able to try these products out, getting hands on, and telling people how you know, be able to communicate on how great these things actually are. So, you know that. You know, get other people excited about it that you can carry that excitement on into, you know, the, the audience. And speaking you of know, YouTubers, for... you have to have a big, successful channel just to be able to attend E3. Yeah. It's that closed to people in the industry. And you have to be, yeah. you know, you have to be somebody Pretty much already like, there. You have to be somebody like Angry Joe or Total Biscuit to get in there. Mm -hmm. Um, like us, we couldn't get in there. You would have to be someone like him, like Angry Joe, yeah. Little Biscuit. I, I um, think I think open the public would be its best bet long term. Yeah, yeah. So it, best bet long term would be best for it. In short, E three needs to evolve with the times. Mm -hmm. and exactly. That sums it up. The fact that it hasn't is, and the fact that it's expensive to attend, basically the 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 big answer is money. The yeah, expense is, is not it's as big as big as a problem as they should be getting something for what they're paying for it. Yeah, it should be worth the amount of investment that they put in, and that's that's why nobody's showing up because it's not worth the investment. Okay, old school. Hope that helped you out. Let's go on to question number four. Question number five is going to be special because that's your question, and you basically already answered that, but we'll hear your, your side of the story. But let's move on to four. All right, the owner of Gamers Bay, Gamers Bay himself, has asked how to deal with... Uh, how to deal with trolls in online games and his we've we've spoken on this subject before in uh, threads on gamers bay he plays left for dead 2 and what happens is is you get these people that come into matches and what they'll do is they'll run on ahead and they will attract the zombies get themselves killed deliberately and ruin the experience for everybody else um, mm -hmm. And he says this happens fairly often. And on Steam, there is a way to deal with people who are who have problems because and this is for games that are protected by you know, VAC, Valve Anti Cheat, essential what what it's called. And this affects um, Half Life Two Deathmatch, Team Fortress Two. The Left 4 Dead series, Gary's Mod, any games that are made by Valve. And what you do is you get the person's, um, you, you get the person's name that they show up as in the game, you look up their profile based on that name, and you block that person. And when you do that, in Valve games that go through Steam's servers for multiplayer, you will never enter a game with that person, and when they go to play, it will not pair you up on a server with them. As long as it's a VAC-protected server. If it isn't, then you could end up in the same server. But if it is, if it's an official Steam server that you're playing on, then that person will not appear on that server with you. They won't be able to appear on that server with you, and that's a way to deal with that. You can also... If someone is a problem and they're harassing people in the game, you know, you know, our, you know, tempers flare and people say things and they get abusive sometimes, especially with these trolls. 
you can report them. There's a mechanism in Steam to report people, and if enough people report them, they can be banned from Steam entirely, or banned from a specific game entirely, or a specific server. And For someone are, just being a problem. Yeah, and yeah. There, there are similar mechanisms in Xbox Live and PSN. Oh, and... You know, I think I, can I give... think most games generally have some mechanism for dealing with it. There's nothing that's bulletproof, because you're gonna run into that person you ain't met before, who's just gonna be a troll, and just, yeah. you know, you, you kind of have to do your best to kind of work around it. Because sometimes there's there's not a whole lot you can do other than try to use the tools as best to your advantage, yeah. and then you know, maybe try to focus more on going in with gamers that you know that you have fun with and you group together and stuff. Um. It, it's a it's a tough one because there's no there's no bulletproof method I don't think. No, there are some tools, but you, can you use the tools to the best of your ability. Um, but I'm not sure there's ever a foolproof method. Yeah, I mean, if you're playing an MMO, most MMOs have a way of you to a block or blacklist, blacklist another player. Yeah, report another player for abuse, for harassment, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um. I don't know what Call of Duty does on PC for that. I don't play Call of Duty at all. Yeah. Um, if so, I would probably ban a lot of... I would probably block and ban a lot of people depending on... <laughs> considering, <laughs> considering, you know, the uh, community on that game. Um, I haven't run into situations like that with Team Fortress 2. Team, Team Fortress 2 players tend to be really good people. I think it kind of depends on the community, too, because I think some communities, I think you get a better, you get different groups of people that tend to attract towards certain types of games. And it's not to say that, you know, well, you're not a good person because you're attracted to certain yeah. games. No, it's just, I think, I think there's a certain mentality that I think people just sort of get lost on in when they get into certain games. And they, plus, I think a lot of times there was an era where I think sort of cheating was a thing to do. And I, you know, especially back in the, you know, days of the sewer, not sewer shark, God, the um, game shark and some of those other cheat tools and hacks mm -hmm. and stuff that people thought that were just fine for a standalone game, you know, in putting the cheat code in, you know, up, up, down, down, etc. And you got into the era where it's an online game and they tried to take that same cheat mentality into the game and then they, you know, it didn't go well and still doesn't. And mm -hmm. it, it it's it's not it's not appropriate in those in those places. Everyone's got to have a you know, level playing field. It's like if you want to go and cheat in a game and have all that, we'll go. There's plenty of other games out there and go have fun with those, you know. But yeah, it, Tom, it's, it's going to happen. There's going to. Uh, good. You know, Tom Clancy's Division has had issues with uh, with cheaters after its yeah. launch. I mean, there, there's been some serious problems there, and they're finally getting around to actually doing something about it banning people yeah. who have been who've been hacking the um hack basically hacking the player data to give themselves an unfair advantage mm -hmm. it, it, it also kind of comes down to the developer support uh, for a particular game like valve like you were saying at vac mm -hmm. gives a good tool for you know eliminating an individual you know from being a problem it kind of comes down to how much the developer is conscious of this game needs tools for other players to handle mm -hmm. individuals who want to act out in that way. And some games don't have any mechanisms like that. I mean, yeah, and when you have that, it just it's a nightmare experience mm -hmm. because there's no way to control it. Uh, you might be, you know, if a game like, you know, say, uh, Unreal Tournament, let's say you're causing problems... I think on the server side, the server admin can kick someone. And I think they can mm -hmm. even ban them based on their IP. But that's it. The the game company has yeah. no control over that. Yeah. And, but with official official Valve servers on Valve games, if you block someone and you you play the matchmaking system in Left 4 Dead 2 will not pair you up on the same server. Yeah, that's the best way to contain it. Containment's as best you can really yeah. get. But this is, it. Steam, 
Steam is not like Xbox Live. It is not like PSN. You don't go through Steam for every multiplayer game. It only uses it for certain games that utilize Steam's servers for multiplayer. And this is, these are mostly only um, Valve's games and maybe a few others, but all the rest to do their own thing online. They don't, it does not mm -hmm. provide the online connection. You don't pay extra for online like you do with PSN and Xbox Live for, with Steam. You go through your PC's internet connection with, um, with all the games on, on PC with Steam. So Valve does not control the internet connection on PC if you if you use Steam, Valve doesn't control the internet connection, whereas on a game console, Sony and Microsoft control the internet connection. So you're not going to get that kind of protection from non-Valve games. Only Valve-based games you're going yeah. to get that kind of protection from. If like like it, in Final Fantasy, I have to use the Final Fantasy selection of tools because they don't control that, for example. Correct. So, you know, right. I blacklisted a lot of people in Final Fantasy fourteen, mostly Jill sellers for sending vote kicking in parties for somebody going crazy stuff, stuff like that. Yes. Yes. I mean, I was in um I was in one dungeon and someone was kicked for harassment. Mm hmm. You know. So So Gamers Bay, I hope this helps you out. You know, the best thing, the one advice I give the most for online trolls is don't feed the trolls. The worst. <laughs> the, don't feed the wildlife. Yeah, don't feed the wildlife. The worst thing you could ever do to a troll, the worst thing you could ever do to an internet troll is ignore them. That is the cruelest thing you can do is ignore them. They thrive off attention and they thrive off of it and if you ignore them, they just can't stand it, and they'll eventually go away. That's why they're doing it, to get attention. That's what they're doing, to get attention. They, they're, they're, they're screaming out for attention, and the only way they know how to do it is to act like jerks. And I've blocked people on... Uh, I've blocked people on Google+, and on YouTube because of it. Because they just completely... Oh, at, I don't know what it is about YouTube and trolls. For YouTube's some reason, its own. YouTube's its own creature. It, it, it's, it, I have it the theories about is, YouTube as well. Anyway, it's its yeah. own animal. It attracts. It's its own thing. Its own thing. So I hope this answers your question. And now we're getting to your question. Your question concerned VR. Would it be a success or a fad? Yeah. And you've expressed interest in the HTC Vive for its uh, whole mm -hmm. room VR. And there's been some... The demo I saw looked pretty neat. Oh, yeah. When we were watching Barnacle's, uh, the video of mm -hmm. Barnacle's Nergasm, Jerry was wearing a uh, HTC Vive, and he was at his friend's house. And he was playing various different games. One was a zombie survival game. Another one was the Space Pirate Trainer. There was the Tilt Brush, where you uh, paint in midair. It was a Google app. I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things um, I wanted to say uh, first before you get to what you were wanting to say. One of the things is VR is paralleling what we saw with mobile games, touch mobile games, in the beginning. And is what it is is we're seeing a lot of uh, what you would call it, uh, what's the word, proof of concept games. A lot of the uh -huh. games on Steam for VR, a lot of them are proof of concept stuff like um, the blue, blue, I think it's Blue Deep, where you're you're down, you're at a shipwreck, and you're having an encounter with a whale, or um, the space pirate trainer, 
or The Lab, which is a, a game portal based game. As long that, as they don't uh, have a Jonah style encounter with a whale, <laughs> I think we're all right. Yeah, you know, the lab where basically it's portal themed, where you repair robots and do different do different mini games in the portal universe mm -hmm. from Valve. Uh, there are God a portal game on VR that would be really disorienting. <laughs> it's it's not like portal that. was disorienting enough. It's not like that kind. It's a bunch of mini games, but. Uh. Um, it would be a trip, though. Yeah, but a lot of this stuff for HTC Vive is mostly a lot of, uh, in a lot of experimental stuff. You don't haven't seen any, mm -hmm. um, what you would call meaty games. Mm -hmm. Same thing with uh, the Oculus Rift. Also, a lot of games for the Oculus Rift are games that have been out for a while now that have been given a. Uh, um, have been given VR capability, such as Elite it's, Dangerous. It's, it's, yeah. It's interesting, too, because today I was having a little bit of trouble with the machine and during the, up, you know, I was doing some upgrades and updates, and one of the updates I got was the um, uh, um, support for VR in the graphics driver. Mm -hmm. I saw that go in today, so. But I need a new machine first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I need some new need... hardware. Yeah, you need some hefty hardware to drive these headsets. You have to have a working on the to-do list. You have to have working USB three. Uh, I think you need to have a certain kind of HDMI HDMI out for these to function properly, and you have to have enough mm -hmm. graphics horsepower. You have to have at least a at least a GTX nine eighty. 980 or, seems to be the one I keep hearing about. Or R9 290 or better, or on the yeah. AMD side, and a good uh, and a good processor. Yeah, basically I need a new machine. Yeah, that was everything I need. <laughs> and what I was going to continue with is mobile games. When the iPhone first launched, and the iPhone was not the first device to do touch. But they were the yeah. first to Palm make Pilots it. Palm Pilots and whatnot came yeah. long before there. Yeah. But they were the first to make it ma popular. They were fir first to make it mainstream. Mainstream. Palm Pilots, you know, it was a niche audience with the Palm Pilots, mostly business users. But it went, it got into the hands of the average person on the street with the uh, Apple iPhone. And when you when they started allowing apps on the iPhone, then you could. And you had these basic games that were mainly proof of concept applications. They weren't anything special. And then all that changed when you got Angry Birds. And that was one oh of God, the I first played that for hours. big game. That was one of the first big games for for mobile. It was the killer app for the iPhone. I and got it, so mad at that game. And then it went to Android and and it's, I mean, it's still popular, I and mean, they're bringing out a movie for it. And based, <laughs> based on the trailer, it's going to be awesome. I think it's probably going to be R-rated. <laughs> R-rated or at least PG-13. Hey, it worked It worked for Deadpool. So. <laughs> but um, I think that's what we're seeing now with VR. We're seeing a lot of experimental stuff. Um, the Oculus Rift has a lot of games that support it, but there are games that have already been out for a while that have had VR shoehorned into them, like um, Elite Dangerous, and um, there's another game, Eve Valkyrie is launching, but that was built for VR. Um, there's been talk about putting VR into um, Minecraft, there's been experiments with VR and a creepers series of other games. VR. We have creepers in VR. With, I mean, they're bad enough in 2D. <laughs> I, I, scream, I scream at them enough as it is. Creeper! Oh. God, that one tunnel. <laughs> and recently there, were, uh, there was news that a, a group had developed a plug-in, an open-source plug-in, that allow that would allow Oculus Rift only games to work with the HTC Vive. 
so yeah. you could sit down and, and use it as if it were an Oculus Rift. Because the, the two headsets are really designed for completely different, different audiences. The Oculus Rift mm -hmm. is designed for people who want to play immersive games where you're you're sitting in the cockpit of a ship or you're looking from the perspective of a pro of a person holding a gun or a weapon of some kind and moving around in a game world and you're using a traditional controllers or something different whereas the HTC Vive is for a completely different experience where you're actually moving around through a room in in full 3D you're actually walking around through a room and the sensors and the cameras on the headset know where the walls are, where most obstacles are. And it, they're designed for completely different experiences. Although the, the, the Vive can still function the same way a Rift does for experiences it's, where you It just sit seems down. to me on the offset, just sitting on the surface, that the, the Vive would have more broader application capabilities because it should be able to do essentially both. Yes. Full room and sit down. Mm-hmm. Um, that to me seems like that's why initially that seems to me like maybe the better gets because you have both options available where the other one you're just sitting down all the time. Yeah. So it seems like there's more capabilities, at least on the surface, just, just, just looking at it at a glance, it, ma it makes it look like there's more options available there. Now, and, we... you know, the, the, the ported response time that appears to be the case with it, so... Yeah, you know whether that adds up to some actual thingies or not. You know that's yet to be seen. Now, we spoke off camera about this, and you had a long spiel about VR and how it would become truly successful. Could you elaborate a little more? Now you were. Well, I think what was it I said again? <laughs> you on the spot. <laughs> um, yeah, putting me on the spot. I I think my my take on it was that if if I recall what I was saying right, was really you need something like the way Angry Birds was to flat panels and the way Doom was to graphics, 3D in general, is you need an application to make it popular, and you need it to become less expensive a commodity type item for it to really you know be you know like you can go down and buy one for 250 at your local best buy mm -hmm. or something you know where you can just go off and it, the cost is not like 800 you're still going to wind up needing the hardware of course but you know that's going to come in time for everybody oh yeah the hardware will eventually reach that plateau but the, the but these machines also themselves individually need to reach a stage where you know, you can get one for Christmas for 250 300 no, you know, no more. And you, you, there's these particular games, you know, that really are so matched to the you know, hardware that you... It'd be like, you know, yeah, you can play Angry Game with a mouse, but you really couldn't see yourself playing Angry, Angry Birds with a mouse. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you, you reach up, you touch the birdie, and you drag him back, and you let him go. And it's a, it's a, it's a more interactive experience. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what, when you're talking about VR, you need a game that really takes advantage of the experience of, yeah, the game might function without it, and you could use a mouse and keyboard, but the game is built in such a way that the experience is just missing, it's, it, you know, without it. It's like watching Avatar in, in, without 3D. It just doesn't the same. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it defines the platform. It defines this is how you do this at this level. And it would have to be a and game And I think with... that plus... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would have to be a game with massive mass appeal, right? Just mm -hmm. like yeah. Angry Birds had mass appeal with people. And yeah, simple, addictive, fun, and in depth. You mm -hmm. know, where it's challenging, but it's easy to pick up. Anybody can pick up on it. You know, you, it, it, it's it's it reaches a wider audience that even people who may not be into it could sit down and put one on and have enjoyment with it. You know, and it really takes off. And, you know, again, the cost being the thing that you don't have to have this mountain of money in order to, you know, get into it. I think when those two things are overcome, I think that's when it has the potential of not being just another fad. Yeah. Because right now, right now, it's poised to be just a boutique item, like, like an Apple product, where it's... Yeah. You can get better somewhere else and it's just over expensive that's what these have are 
sort of leaning towards. They're and leaning the, towards the other thing that scares me is getting into the hardware wars, another hardware wars where it's like, well, this model can do this and that model can do that. And you get all these exclusive titles for this Oculus and exclusive titles for the Vive and et cetera, et cetera. And that's just – haven't they ever learned yet that's counterproductive? I mean, you know, that, that drives me nuts. That's what would get – that's – Speaking of which, it was I brought up that um, plug-in that allows the uh, the HTC, HTC Vive um, that makes it usable with Oculus-only games, that games mm-hmm. that only support the Oculus Rift. There's no uh, standard that the all the headsets utilize so they can work with each other. There's right. no set. There's no set standard. They all have competing APIs, competing ways they they work. There's no so, standardized yeah, what, interoperability. Yeah, so you'll wind up with you want to play this really cool game and you might have this great killer app. Thing is, you can only run it on one system versus the other and you wind up with a whole heap and help of mess and everybody, you know, the whole community kind of hurts from that because, yeah, you know, half the group that have managed to invest their money into one of these headsets doesn't want to drop the money for the other. Yeah. For example, because they either can't afford it, or it's just like you know, it just maybe for some reason physically they can't use that headset because maybe the design they physically can't handle it. You know, yeah. maybe they need maybe that one because of the way these things are designed. You know, maybe people might be sensitive to one versus the other. We don't know what type of sensitivities different people have when you get to a mass market level. Yeah, you know, there'll be people who just you know get vertigo no matter what they do and they won't wear them. But, you know, there will be other people who may have those sensitivities, and they may prefer one just because of that. And you shouldn't lock somebody out of a game because they they may physically have issues with one particular model. Mm-hmm. And what you need is something to come along and sort of act as a disruptive force in that, in that market. The po- potentially, potentially that disruptive force would be PlayStation VR, which Sony has talked about uh, bringing to PC. They have been talking about yeah, bringing PlayStation if, if, VR if, to PC. If they brought it, I could see it being more disruptive, third-party market, you know, in that if it if it was on the PC as well, like you could take it like a controller and mm-hmm. plug it into your PC, load a driver up, and then, you know, be able to interact with these games, you know, I that would definitely help stir the pot. The more the merrier, honestly. You know, Stir the and pot. The, and you don't the fact want too many, but definitely more. And the fact that it's below four hundred dollars. It's about three hundred ninety nine. Yeah, that's the commodity thing like I was that. talking about. Yeah, the commodity thing. Yeah, that. And there's all these other competing headsets, most of which work with cell phones. Um, VR on cell phones is a big thing, but you need yeah, really high end cell phones. Not for that. sure what, not sure what to make of that yet. I've I've not seen much into that, and I'm still kind of kind of question mark over my head on that one. Now, it's a lot of it is still more, you know, proof of concept. That to me that to me feels more that to me more feels more fatty than you know as in a fad than 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 anything else right now. Yeah. Than trying to get into it that way unless they somehow make that take off. I I look at that and go like I don't know. That that feels like they're really stretching now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe they work. I haven't tried one. Maybe they're great. I I don't know, but I just look at it and go, I, it's going to be kind of a sell for me to try to get me to wear the headset and stick my phone into it and use that as a VR headset. I don't see the technology working that way well. The problem is most of them I don't know, are designed maybe it to does, work. But... Yeah. The problem is most of them are designed to work with just one type of phone or two or just a, a small mm-hmm. um, you know, selection of phones like Samsung yeah. and iPhones. Basically, hardware specific, hardware you know, specific. systems, and it kind of makes sense because they've all got their own hardware specifications and designs. I mean, mm-hmm. most Apple phones are nowhere near designed like any, you know, Android phone, and vice versa. So I could wind up seeing how that would be the case, but yeah. you know, you'd have all those different specifications, and it's going to be a nightmare for developers. Yeah, and to if, get that, all that to work right, and if Sony can release, you know, the PlayStation VR for PC. And make it mm-hmm. you know, maybe even Oculus compatible. They can mm-hmm. negotiate with um, Facebook and Oculus and, and Oculus to make it interoperable. That would be. I, I, 
a cheaper alternative. I, I think, yeah, I think also getting an industry standard, like, you know, the way the way DirectX and OpenGL sort of work is industry standards, even though they sort of compete with each other, most games generally support, and most are generally available on most people's machines at some level that you don't yeah. really have to worry about it that much. You know it's generally going to work. Yes. And so whether you have an HTC or, or, or an Oculus or whatever, that you know that it doesn't really matter. The game is going to function. You may not take advantage of all the particular features, but you know that it's going to operate and you can enjoy the game and you don't got to worry about it's X this and X Y that and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. it, it's going to have to come down to that or it's never going to really take off. Yeah. Hardware wars and platform wars and technology wars never serve anybody except corporate egos, and that's not serving anybody. Now, Sony can attest to that during the VHS versus Betamax war. Yeah. So, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a failed thing for everybody when, when, when corporations get into that kind of a tit-for-tat sort of know, thing. You know what we need to watch out for? Is which one is the porn industry going to pick up first? <laughs> that that is it. What, sell it. that is what has decided <laughs> these victories in the past. The porn industry <laughs> wanted to use Betamax. Sony wouldn't allow it, so they went to VHS and VHS won. Didn't didn't that also settle? I, I'm not certain. Did that also settle the Blu-ray versus BD DVD or something like? Or the not BD um the HD DVD war? Didn't it also cause that to have an influence on there, or was that just? That That's also, uh, originally Sony was not going to allow them to do it, but then they changed their they changed their mind. <laughs> and, Somebody who uh, learned from history. And now Blu-ray is the standard, and HD DVD is history. And yeah. <laughs> I think we're going to see there there there's already been some products announced for. Uh, there's already been a few products announced for uh, porn. The internet's for porn. The, the internet's internet for porn. It's for porn. porn. That's, why, that's, that's why it took off. It was really porn that did it. It had nothing to do... The commercial success of it was based on the porn industry. That, that's what it was. That is Gotta get why started that, somewhere. That is why the net oh. was born. Yeah. Yeah. For home uh, delivery of porn. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, uh, something to keep something to keep a watch out on the horizon. Uh-huh. Alrighty then. <laughs> on that note. Our porn. <laughs> on that note. But that's what it would take for Yeah. VR to be a success. Make it more accessible what, to more no. people. Make it more accessible. Well, and, porn too, yeah. but to make yeah. it more accessible to more people, accessible less expensive, and, and cross-platform, etc. Standardized APIs so they so they can work together. Inter more interoperability. Interoperability. Yeah. Or else it will become a niche item, you know, a boutique item basically, for people who can afford it. And I, I really would like it to be more than that. I think it has great potential for some really awesome gaming. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to, a, like, No Man's Sky, I'm looking forward to that, and I'm looking forward to that being in VR. I'm looking forward to a good racing game in VR. I'd love to have a good, you know, steering wheel controller headset, mm -hmm. you know, combination, so I can really sit in that car. I can turn my head over and look at that guy next to me. You know, and you know, see that we're nose to nose. I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to those kind, of, those kinds of things. Oh, definitely. I mean, there's there's massive potential for that in this te yeah. in this technology to really be immersed into it. You know, to have a, you know, a space shooter game where you know, like like a like an X-wing game or some other kind of space shooter game where you're out in space and you know you're doing the dog fights and you can look around your cockpit and see who's around. You can look mm -hmm. down, and see your screen, and all your status screens, and see your, you know trolls and things and really really be there and really feel like you're in that world be immersed into it dipped into the cockpit of a of, of a space fighter and and you know flying around i mean you know all hd full surround sound everything and really be there and you know have some good controller steps I, I, i'm looking forward to that kind of stuff i've been waiting for it for years mm -hmm. you know i'm glad we're finally on the front boundary of of this for the first time we saw it a little bit in the 90s, but technology was, just wasn't ready then. Yeah. I mean, it, was, it was primitive, 
In fact, I saw I saw some in the 80s, just a, this big arcade machine, where you strap on a headset and you have you held a uh, a gun controller with a joystick on it, mm -hmm. and you walked through this wireframe um, with vector graphic world upstairs. There was a pterodactyl mm -hmm. that would swoop down, try and grab you, while at the same time you had to shoot a gun at another person. It was an interesting, it was interesting, it was very early, the machine cost Joust 10, VR. the machine cost $10,000, yeah, that would be, that would be incredible Joust in VR. VR, yeah, yeah, that would be incredible in VR, Joust, uh, I could name a whole lot of other games that would be great in virtual reality, oh, I know, there, there, there'd be a lot, hey, Pac-Man, no, I was kidding, <laughs> No, no, no. Turn Batman into a horror and, flick with Slimer chasing you. And Hello Games has even come out and said that VR support for games like No Man's Sky would be great as a launch title for. Oh, that game looks perfect for it. PlayStation that game looks VR. For it. I mean, it would be great for it. And see, it's, and see, that's the thing. For me, I'm looking forward to No Man's Sky because I wanted to play it. I really wanted to have a game like that for a long time. I know there's still more I'd love to have done to it. But I think, to me, it's going to come down to the VR headset that gets bought is the one that you know becomes kind of gets there and makes it functional. If I have to go buy it on the PS4 and in order to do that headset and sit in their living room with that on there, I'd, I'd probably do it. You know, and I've you know? been I've been bringing it up a lot in, in the show because I want it now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's taking too long. It's taking them for June is for so this. far better be, away. They better get this right. Yes, they yeah. better get I'm, this I, right because this is the sort of game I've been waiting for for a long time myself. Also, mm -hmm. and they had better get this right. There are other games that are coming really close to a lot of. This, the vision of what I've been wanting, what you've been wanting. Um, mm -hmm. They've added, they added planets to space engineers, and there have been a other. See, to me, I'm like, I'd, I'd love to have No Man's Sky and put space engineers into it, put Minecraft into it, put you know uh, the other ocean game you were playing into it, where you can go in and build vehicles, build crafts, but, you know, like, take that, you know, robot building game and stick it in there, you know, mm -hmm. and, and have this massive super sandbox kind of game. Oh, I'm yes. waiting for the super sandbox. Mm-hmm. And so far, this is the closest to the super sandbox that I've seen yet. Where you don't just land on the planet and start mining resources, you can actually build a colony and attract you can build. You people can build a to colony. it, NPCs to it. Yeah. You can kind of a civilization style game where you could literally become, you know, king of the world. Oh yeah. You gotta, you know, attract colonists and you know, kind of almost Sim City esque in some ways, you know, where you lay out your colony and you lay out your resources and you lay you lay out your city grids and your your residential environments and, you know, your indestruct indestructible. Your industry and, <laughs> and, and your commercial and hope it's indestructible before the space pirates come down and try to blow it all away. And, you know, and if you've got a big enough city and platform, you can actually see it out in space. You know, I, I, it's like, where is this? Where is it? <laughs> and this would be great in VR. It would be absolutely oh, it would be. It'd be, it'd be amazing it'd be in VR. Stellar. Yeah. All right. I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. <laughs> okay. Anybody well, out there, I'm still waiting. This has been right. the first episode of Q&A with Mike. Cheers. And, you know, it's good to have you back to the show, you know, to, to the channel. Thank you. And we'll be doing this once a month, so that way uh, the community can get us some questions. And we'll take five of the best questions submitted, do the research on them, and do what we did just now in answering them. And hopefully entertain and educate at the same time. That's Sounds the good. aim. All right. And if you have any questions you want to submit for May's show, uh, submit them via Twitter, via Google Plus, uh, via the official uh, Gamers Bay Q and A with Mike thread, which will go up very soon after this. Uh, 
after this show goes up. In fact, you can submit them via the thread that will appear in Google, in um, Gamers Bay for this show. There, and we'll take the be five best questions, research them, and you'll see them in May's in the show in May. Right. So I am Mike. And my co-host, yep, we will see you next time.